All right, so now I'm going to talk about uh, my own PhD work. So now I get to speak, you know, as for myself, um, as a grad student at Berkeley. Uh, and for my PhD project, I've been building this uh, Berkeley out of order machine, uh, or the Boom processor. Uh, but I realized I couldn't really give this update talk uh, about what I've done with Boom in the last year without also really talking about all of the uh, incredible momentum in the ecosystem that Boom fits into. Um, so in reality, maybe this talk is actually titled uh, an update to the Berkeley architecture research infrastructure and you know, maybe with a little cameo from Boom. Uh, so, so we'll see. Um, as for Boom, uh, this is a superscalar, out of order, RISC-V processor. It's synthesizable, uh, parameterizable, open source, uh, and it's written in Berkeley's Chisel hardware construction language. So you can you know, download this, play around with it, um, you know, accept pull requests, tell me what you think. Um, so I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so the first question is, is how do you make an out-of-order processor? Uh, turns out it's actually pretty easy. Uh, step one, uh, just make a new hardware uh, language. Uh, Verilog is really awful and it's just going to slow you down. Uh, so start with a new language. And then step two is just start with a working processor. Um, it's way easier than starting from scratch. And there's a lot of really, you know, unglamorous parts of a processor, you know, the IOs, the debug stuff, the devices, and you know, if you write that yourself, you're just going to have bugs anyway, so, so don't do that. Just start with a working processor and then make it out of order. So uh, that advice is kind of like, how do you make a chocolate chip cookie? Step one, start with the cookie. And then step two, just add the chocolate chips and then claim credit for having created the whole thing. So, you know, in reality, how do I make an out of order processor? You know, it takes a village. Uh, it's a lot more than just me. Uh, I'm leveraging an ISA that's really, uh, really out of order friendly. Uh, I have a, uh, a hardware construction language uh, that brings in object-oriented programming as well as uh, functional programming. Uh, something I'll talk about today is we have this fertile uh, exposing the uh, RTL intermediate representation that allows us to do a lot of really neat things. Uh, and I have the rocket ship uh, SOC platform, um, which is really an entire working processor uh, that I can come in and, and just add my little piece to it. So there's a lot of people, professors, grad students, undergrads, staff, programmers, uh, that I have to thank for working on, you know, some of, some of these pieces. Uh, so the first piece that I want to talk about is the rocket ship SOC generator. So uh, this was started about five years ago. It's been taped out, I don't even know how many times now. I think maybe 12, 13. Um, but they've been able to hit it up about 1.6, 1.7 uh, gigahertz. I think the fastest was an IBM 45. Uh, and the idea is you have this in-order rocket core um, and it has private L1 caches, and then you can have multiple of these tiles, and they can be heterogeneous tiles. You can customize each individual one. Uh, and then it'll talk through uh, a network uh, to um, L2 cache banks. Uh, and this, you know, boots Linux, it's a, it's a full processor. It implements the full RISC-V RV64G uh, ISA. Um, and we have a tech report on the rocket ship itself. And so what I do with Boom is I take out a rocket core, and I put in a Boom core. So basically, Boom, uh, it speaks the same Tilink uh, interface, it speaks the same ISA, and so to the outside world, they don't realize that a Boom core just kind of snuck along for the ride. Um, so, you know, that's kind of how I, you know, how I, I'm able to get Boom uh, to be a full processor system without having to do all the work. Um, so in terms of the rocket ship updates, uh, the big news is, is that the devs graduated. Uh, so they moved on to a startup called Sci-5, and the idea is that their startup is uh, supporting RISC-V and RocketShip uh, as open source projects, and you as a customer would come to them if you want a RISC-V chip with some amount of customized logic. Um, so they're able to leverage open source hardware to uh, much more uh, quickly uh, deliver a product and add value. So I think I got this from one of their slides. Um, the stuff in yellow is, you know, custom stuff like a custom accelerator or custom instructions, custom I.O. And RocketShip is actually, you know, um, you know, this kind of stuff in the middle. And, uh, you know, one of the things you have to admit is, you know, is that rocket ship is now really graduated Berkeley. It's more than just Berkeley. And so um, what I can announce today is that we're working towards uh, a new rocket ship foundation. So uh, this is something that um, it's not Berkeley, it's not sci-fi, that this will be its own separate entity that people can feel comfortable with uh, using and pushing updates to. Uh, and improving as a shared resource. So for example, Sci-5 has been working on you know, the UARTs and the SPIs and a lot of these IOs, and they'll push that to the Rocketship Foundation, and that's something that we all can get for free. 
Uh, as Berkeley, we have new grad students that understand Rocketship and have been, you know, improving it themselves. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, Versailles 5 can do whatever it wants, but, you know, we need to do this for research, so we're certainly going to continue to maintain it, uh, if nothing else. So, um, you know, uh, last I looked, there was 37 contributors to Rocketship uh, across a, a range of, um, a, a range of universities and companies. Uh, so this is a, you know, a pretty cool project. Uh, I was looking through the logs. Uh, it started, at least the repo started in August 2011, and there's 3,588 commits uh, as of this morning. And in the last four weeks, there's been over 300 commits. Um, so this is part of what happens when you actually now have uh, literally professional engineers working on a project, um, as opposed to going as fast or as slow as grad students go. Uh, so there's been a lot of development. Uh, there's also been, uh, they've, uh, Sci 5 has put together more documentation on Rocketship. Um, and uh, we've been making changes to the repository to make this a lot quicker to iterate and push back changes and hopefully make this easier for downstream uh, users of Rocketship as well. Um, so we're still trying to figure that out. Um, we also are updating the latest privilege specs, uh, the latest um, we can support on cache memory operations now for memory mapped I.O. And we also support the latest RISC-5 uh, external debug specs. So you have things like breakpoints, standalone boots, uh, and also for those that are familiar with the HTIF interface, we've uh, since removed uh, that. Um, and the other advantage of when you have a company that's helping develop open source hardware uh, is that now they're actually motivated to add configurations that as academics we could just never justify. So for example, they've now added 32-bit support to Rocket. You can turn on and off individual ISA extensions. Uh, and they've also added the compressed uh, ISA to Rocket. Um, and although Rocketship is targeting ASIC, uh, they also have been making changes to Rocket uh, that help better target FPGA platforms uh, as well as go down to much smaller uh, microcontroller uh, forms. So, you know, changes to the uh, caches, so now there's a blocking cache or non-blocking depending upon, you know, where you want to trade off performance in an area. Um, something else is that we've updated Chisel 3. I'll explain what that actually means. But basically there's no longer any C++ simulation backend uh, we're now only emitting Verilog and using Verilator as our, our free and fast simulation target. Uh, and uh, there's probably been two more updates to Rocketship since I've started this talk. So even I'm having trouble following all the things that are going on. Uh, but there's a, a lot more development that's been going. Uh, so now I'll talk about Chisel, which is the hardware construction language uh, that we also developed at Berkeley to help us uh, make processors uh, a lot faster and easier. And I want to clarify that this is not a high-level synthesis language. Um, it's, you know, you're still thinking in terms of wires and memories and registers. Um, but this, you know, allows you to, to leverage things like object-oriented programming and functional programming uh, to essentially describe in Scala uh, your hardware graph that then gets mapped down to, to Verilog. And the idea is that you have one chisel source code and you can target different backends. You can target, you know, ASIC or FPGA or Verilator simulation, you know, or different, uh, you know, ASIC technologies, you know, may require different Verilog outputs. Um, so that's, that's the goal is to just have one source. Um, so we've now created something we call Chisel 3. And the idea here was that we wanted to take our researchware, uh, which had, was very faithful and had done a good job of letting us tape out chips and, and, and demonstrate the idea, and now we wanted to turn it into an actual real quality compiler platform. Um, and in particular, we were hitting up against that we wanted to expose the intermediate representation for hardware designers uh, to do all sorts of interesting little transform passes to the IR. Uh, so we did a clean rewrite of Chisel from the ground up. And so Chisel 3 is still embedded in Scala, uh, but what Chisel 3 does is it now generates fertile uh, RTL code. And then fertile, uh, which is, you know, our goal is to serve as the IR for hardware or like, you know, the LLVM for hardware. Uh, that will now take in the, uh, the RTL and generate Verilog uh, on the backside. Um, and this has been a success for us. Uh, so now, you know, you can add your own transformations. Uh, in fact, something that, you know, may be of, of real interest for this group is that you can even throw away Chisel. And, you know, maybe you want Chisel in Python, or maybe you have your own front end you've been developing. And you can target uh, Fertile and then leverage all the transforms uh, in the ecosystem that uh, we've been building in Fertile. Um, and so there is, um, right now, Chisel 3 and Fertile are in alpha. Uh, in a few days, I think we may go beta. And what we define beta as is actually having documentation and tutorials. So it's a little rough right now. 
but we're pretty happy with it, and this is what we've been using uh, for all of our stuff at Berkeley and, and Sci-5. Uh, and there's also a spec to go and download. Uh, hopefully it's up to date, but you can see exactly what is the fertile uh, IR specification. Uh, and to give an example of, you know, why would you want to play with the IR, uh, you know, so some of the examples we've been doing is if you want to see the code coverage of your hardware, if you want to run it through a torture tester, are you actually really uh, seeing a lot of code coverage? Um, I like the fact that we can do scan chain insertion, so instead of trying to uglify your RTL code, you just kind of just magically get scan chains now uh, through an IR pass. Um, you know, or for SRAMs, uh, you know, the way that you map to an FPGA memory versus maybe to a particular SRAM technology um, is different, and so you may want an IR pass that's going to help, um, you know, maybe make modifications to your memories to better target the SRAMs that you have access to. So there's a lot of IRs that, or a lot of our IR passes that you may want to uh, use in your designs. Uh, in terms of, you know, new and upcoming features that are, you know, have been enabled going to Chisel 3, um, you know, so we have black box support, now we've been adding parameterized black box support. Uh, we added analog types, this is for when you're interfacing with the black box, and maybe you're interfacing with an in-out, so that way you can make sure that the IR doesn't do anything weird with that. Um, uh, we've been doing a lot of serious work on multi-clock uh, domain support. You know, as, you know, typically when you take out something like rocket ship, you know, the L2 is going to be in, other, in, a, in a different clock domain, and the tiles may be in their own clock domains. So in terms of fixed ratio um, clock, uh, clock differences, that's a first class citizen in, in Chisel. Uh, and if you're doing something that's different phases or different frequencies, um, basically what we do is we do a black box at the domain crossing and you provide your own synchronous uh, FIFOs. Um, although we're considering maybe using asynchronous reset to Chisel, uh, and the idea is that if we do asynchronous reset, then Chisel can provide its own asynchronous FIFOs, and then all of multi-clock can be first class citizen. Uh, and then there's other things, you know, we've been adding DSP support uh, and also annotations so that way in your chisel code you can, I think, annotate all the way back to the back end to do different things. Um, so uh, a lot of stuff we've been, we've been doing with chisel in the last year. Uh, and if you use chisel 2, uh, let us know so we, we can help uh, you migrate off of it. Um, hopefully it's not too hard, but we don't want there to be a Python 2, Python 3 situation. Uh, we want everyone to, to use chisel 3. Um, so I think with that, I'll, I'll stop for a, a question or two if there's anything on bar uh, before I switch to Boom. Hi, uh, Olof from Fossil Foundation. Uh, I'm very interested in the IR. I know that you have been, um, uh, been talking about this earlier. Um, but have you, have you talked to other people? Have you, are you, have you managed to spread the word about your IR? I mean, the thing with an IR is that we need everyone to be on board, or at least many yeah. people to be on board, especially the EDA vendors. That would be absolutely awesome. So we could, as you say, we could hook up other frontends to this. Have you been making any progress talking to other people? That's why I'm here. <laughs> Great. Uh, I mean, so we do have, um, I, I wasn't quite sure how much I could really talk about this, but we do have quite a few people that are using Chisel external to us. Uh, and even giving us uh, uh, pull requests, pushing back to Chisel and p pushing back to Fertile. Um, and the issue is typically people are coming along the ride because maybe they want to use Rocket Ship, which is in Chisel, uh, or maybe they, um, in this particular case, maybe they do want to use Chisel for their hardware and then Fertile just comes along. Um, so I don't, you know, th this is, you know, very new, we're alpha. Um, you know, we do have quite a few users, um, but I don't know, um, you know, we'll see. This is, I think, the first real big announcement of, of Fertile, of, as you know, it exists and it actually works, and it works as advertised. We have an uh, inter, uh, intermediate representation uh, uh, mailing list on, on LibreCourse, I think. You should uh, send an announcement there, too. Okay, thanks. All right, so now I'll actually talk about, you know, so that's what has been working, you know, uh, the going-ons in my lab for the last year. Um, and so now I'll talk about my own research. Uh, and, you know, it's been a, a lot of fun and a challenge for me to have to keep up with everything else that's been going uh, off in my lab. Uh, this is something that I started in 2012. Um, it's about 10,000 lines of code and it implements the uh, RV64G ISA. So, you know, it boots Linux and, and runs full programs. Um, you know, the way that this works is, you know, you fetch instructions, you know, you have a branch predictor, uh, you put that into a fetch buffer, then you can uh, decode and rename the instructions, and then with rename you go from a logical specifier to the physical specifier, and then you put those into the issue window, and then as instructions, uh, if all of their operands are ready, then they'll request to be issued, and then the selector can select instructions out of order uh, that are ready to go, 
And once they're selected, they'll go to the register file to read their operands, and then they'll go to the function unit, uh, actually execute, and then write back their data uh, speculatively. So the uh, register file is holding both committed and speculative data. The rename table tells you actually what the committed data is. And it's also, in, uh, at least currently, holding both the fixed point and the floating point registers. And again, the map tables tell you which is which. Uh, so this is, you know, there's a lot of ways to do it out of order, and this is uh, what, what has worked pretty well for me. Um, you know, in terms of the benefits of using Chisel and Rocket Ship, uh, Boom is about 10,000 lines of code. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in Boom. Uh, and so it turns out that a lot of this is that I can treat, you know, Rocket Ship almost as, as a library of components. So, you know, I didn't have to write a TLB or a page table walker. I can just instantiate, you know, a page table walker or TLB. And that, you know, saves me a thousand lines of code right there. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that I'm using that are written by other people. You know, 2,000 lines of floating point. I don't want to write a floating point square root, you know, divide unit. Uh, I have an expert that does that, and then I get to leverage that. So this has been a real benefit of using Chisel and Rocket Ship for Boom, is that this lets me very quickly get a processor up and going without having to do a lot of, a lot of the other hard grunt work. Um, the other thing I said about Boom is that it is parameterizable. So, um, you know, one example is you could instantiate a dual issue uh, Boom, and the code for that would look like this in Chisel. So you have your execution units is just an array, uh, and then you just add to that array, uh, you instantiate more modules. And if you want something that looks like this, that's uh, maybe a four issue boom, uh, you just add a, a few more lines of code. Uh, that's the only difference between these two instantiations of boom are those two lines of code. So, um, you know, this is, I'm very excited by the parameterizability that, that Chisel and object oriented programming has enabled me. This would have been a lot harder to do in Verilog. Um, so this is just some of the examples of what you can do in boom. Um, in terms of performance, I've been trying to target, you know, the A9 and the A15, in part because that's just what I have in, you know, in my own possession. Um, and also because, you know, the A9 is an out-of-order ARM core. Uh, it is something that's in their catalog today that you can, you know, buy from them. So I'm hoping that Boom is, you know, competitive both in performance area and price. Uh, and I'm using Cormark just because that's what ARM brags about for their processors. And I think that number is maybe 30% faster than an A9. And although I've not taped out Boom, so I can't make promises about clock frequency, um, based on what Rocket Ship is, is taped out and the fact that I'm using the same memory system, um, Boom should be, you know, very competitive with the fr frequencies of like an A9. Um, and, yes? Is that the uh, so what gives me the performance edge over an A9? Um, well, they're not open source, so that's hard for me to say. Um, <laughs> One of the things is, is I've looked at the branch prediction accuracy. Uh, with the A9, I'm seeing 84% accuracy on Cormark. With Boom, I'm able to get up to 94, 95% branch accuracy. Um, it is 32-bit ARM. I don't know if there was any weirdness that could hurt ARM on that. Um, I do know that their floating point and their uh, vector unit, the Neon, in the A9 is in, in order, although Cormark doesn't use floating points, so that's not actually an issue. But if I did have a floating point benchmark, I think that would show more Boom performance. Um, uh, one thing about the ARM ISA is it uses condition codes, so branch instructions, I mean, they probably fuse, I, I hope they fuse this, uh, but that's at least something where the instruction count would differ, is that they have to do a condition and then branch on the condition, um, although they probably use Macrot Fusion for that, so uh, it's hard for me to say exactly where we're, we're different in the performance, um, but at least the branch predictor is a really obvious one that I have counters that I can point to, uh, but I can't really say a whole lot about what else they're doing. Uh, if you have ideas, I'd love to hear them. Any other questions? So in terms of my laundry list of updates in the last year, uh, I, I open source Boom 10 months ago. Uh, I also put out um, a draft of uh, the design specification, which provides how I put Boom together, uh, what it's actually doing, and some of my reasoning behind what I did. Um, we also released uh, at ISCA 2016, um, we used Boom as part of our case study, so one of my lab mates, Dong Yu, uh, use IR transformations to uh, essentially allow him to run Boom on an FPGA, you know, running, you know, run Linux, run specint on it, on an FPGA, and then stop the simulation, pull off all of the state of the simulation, and then start running at a gate level and get power simulation uh, for a small snapshot, and then start running the FPGA again. Um, so that way we could actually get power estimates of running very long programs like specint 
uh, you know, billions and billions and billions of cycles uh, and get average power estimations on that. So that's, you know, one of the research papers that we put out with Boom. And Boom was just a user. Don, you did all the really hard work there. Uh, I also got, you know, my first external contribution on adding a visualizer. Uh, I have a slide on that. Uh, and also the other things of porting to Chisel 3, Fertile, you know, uncached memory operations, the privilege spec, the debug spec, uh, the high performance monitor counters, and uh, a lot of branch prediction work. And uh, we're just starting the, the progress of um, uh, uh, hopefully doing a tape out, uh, you know, maybe around the January time frame. Uh, and the other thing I want to mention is that we do run Boom on an FPGA for what I use as the, the Zinc platform. Um, and we're finishing up and adding a, a tethered serial interface. Uh, so that way we can get, you know, high performance communication between the, the core and the front end server. Um, for visualization, you know, if you want to see how your software gets scheduled or if you want to see if there's any sort of pipeline bugs, uh, this was added uh, as an external contribution to Boom. Uh, so you dump out a log file and then you have like a Gem5 visualizer uh, provides the visualization. So you can see interesting little tidbits like a, a store to load byte unsigned hazard that shows up in Drystone. Um, and I'm also happy to accept more contributions. So, you know, if it's something like, you know, maybe code that crashes or fixes to the code that crashes, you know, debugging, visualization, or performance uh, enhancements, uh, you know, I'd be happy to chat with, uh, with uh, anyone who wants to, to, to help out. Um, so, let's see. I think with my very short remaining amount of time, I'll, I'll give just a little bit of a deep dive highlight of what I think about day-to-day, um, uh, -day, which is branch prediction. You know, especially when you're super scalar, this is an important part of a processor. Uh, if it takes you, you know, five or six cycles to, uh, to the branch, that could be 12 or 15 instructions that are hiding. Um, so I'll start with our, our, our intrepid little G-share predictor, our, our humble G-share. So you're going to track the last in branch outcomes, and you're going to hash that with the address, and you're going to index some sort of two-bit saturated counter table, and the high order bit tells you to predict taken or not taken. This is what it looks like on a diagram. Now what Boom is actually doing is um, this is the, this, the, the front end stages. So you have, you know, hit the first compute what the next PC is, and then you're going to index your SRAM to fetch the instruction. Um, and that takes a whole cycle get to, for the SRAM access. And then on the next cycle, you get the data back from the SRAM, and then you can do whatever. So um, uh, the first thing we have is what I call a next line predictor. So this is a, a BTB, a BHT, and a return address stack all in one. And that's basically a combinational signal cycle uh, prediction. And if it's accurate, there's going to be no uh, bubbles in the pipeline. The problem, though, is that that's really expensive to do. Uh, and it's also critical in the timing pass. So it's going to be really small. So with, with Boom, what I've added is an overriding or a backing predictor. And that can be uh, bigger, slower, more efficient, but hopefully more accurate. And the idea is that I want to fit that in single ported SRAM. So the way I'm going to implement uh, G-Share is the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually change a two-bit counter. And it's not really a two-bit counter. It's actually a slightly different state machine. So if you're in, a, in, a, in the, uh, a weak state and there's a misprediction, you're going to jump to the strongly uh, opposite state. So if you're weakly not taken and you mispredict, you're going to go to strongly taken state. Uh, I'll leave that as a homework assignment as to why that works out really well. Uh, but just trust me, it helps the hardware design immensely. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to realize for a prediction, we only need the top bit. So let's separate out uh, the prediction bit from the hysteresis bit. So they're going to be in different SRAMs. And in fact, for the prediction bits, we're going to read them on every prediction, but we only need to write them on a misprediction. In terms of the hysteresis bit, we only need, we're going to write to them on every branch resolution, but we only need to read them on a misprediction. So in essence, this allows us, at least uh, as written, to use one read and one write port on our SRAMs. So this is what it looks like in the pipeline. You have your next uh, PC selection state, where you're going to hash the global history and the PC, and then you're going to index in your, uh, your p-table SRAM. Uh, and then for the branch resolution, uh, you're going to, if on every branch, you're going to write into the write buffer, and on a misprediction, you have to read uh, the hysteresis tables. So um, the other thing here is that we don't actually care when the write happens, so we can actually delay writes and buffer them up. So we can actually implement this as single port, uh, because if we're reading, let the read go, and if we're writing, uh, and the write can go when a read's not happening. And since mispredictions are rare, uh, you know, it's not hard to, to schedule the writes. For the prediction, you're always going to read the table because you're always making predictions. In that case, we'll just bank it, and then if you're not reading that particular bank, you can do a write to it. And that way, this fits into single-ported SRAM. 
There's a lot of other things that actually make this challenging to do in hardware. Uh, one thing is that the global history has to you know, tell you what are all the branches ahead of you have done. And that means that when you make a branch prediction, you have to include that in the global history. Unfortunately, it takes two cycles to know what your actual prediction is because you have to read the SRAM and then get it out of the SRAM. So, you know, there's going to be a delayed update to the history that you have to deal with. You also have to snapshot the global history because if you make a missed prediction, you have to reset it. Uh, so you have to figure out how, to, how do we actually store these snapshots and, and reset them. Uh, you also have to design this so that way you can do superscalar predictions. How do you, you know, make predictions and make updates uh, on maybe, you know, a four-wide processor? Um, there's a, a lot of uh, fun little quirks that, that go into even just getting uh, G-Share to work. Now, you know, G-Share is, you know, just one uh, branch predictor, but really I want to explore a whole bunch of different designs of branch predictors. And the one thing I notice is that all of these, you know, want to have global history. So what I've done with the power of, you know, chisel and object-oriented programming is I have a branch predictor pipeline, and I have an abstract branch predictor class. And the abstract branch predictor class can handle all of the, the plumbing of global history tracking and of handling in-flight branch uh, states. And if there's a bug, I fix it once. And then I can have as a concrete class, you know, G-share uh, G or g skew or Tej uh, as the concrete classes. And all they need to know is, oh, here is a global history given to me on high. Let me make a prediction based on that. Uh, so this is how I've designed uh, Boom to allow me to quickly uh, iterate on branch predictors. Um, and I have uh, quite a few uh, branch predictors in Boom. You know, there's you know, the, the obligatory null predictor and random predictor. Uh, there's also the simple G-share, which demonstrates how to interface with stuff. But then there's the synthesizable G-share, which can be either dual ported or banked, depending upon what SRAMs you have access to. Uh, I also, just to demonstrate that this actually worked, uh, very quickly last week added a 2BC GSKU, which is from the EV8 uh, predictor, um, uh, which is a, a you know, very interesting high performance uh, uh, branch predictor. And then in terms of in progress work, I'm, I'm trying to finish up the Tage predictor. I have a prototype that, uh, that demonstrates the idea works, uh, but I haven't yet uh, fitted into the uh, single ported SRAM yet. Um, so. Uh, I think with that, I'll probably uh, yield the rest of my time to any questions. Uh, thank you for your time. Questions? There's um, one uh, benefit the ARM architecture does have is in that they have an indemnity against violating any patent if a violation is found, they'll produce a workaround for that. What's the situation with Boom or Rocket in that situation? The situation regarding what? Uh, regarding patents for, if a f patent violation is found in the oh, article. Uh, oh, patents. So that's a, great, that's a great question. Um, uh, so you're asking about IP and patents, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I forgot to mention this at the Risk V talk. Uh, but one of the goals of the foundation is to assemble um, a library of IP, expired patents, and other such, you know, micro, you know, microarchitectural tricks uh, to try to uh, assemble kind of a portfolio to help defend against some of these things. Um, in terms of out-of-order processing, you know, it's not a new idea. Um, you know, a lot of these things, you know, for example, the thing that uh, Intel and Apple got sued on uh, expires in a few months. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of these ideas, you know, there's not a whole lot of cleverness in Boom. You know, it's pretty much kind of a, oh, this is just, you know, how you'd probably do it. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm an academic, so they can't sue me for much. Um, if someone wants to use Boom, you know, if anything that you use is open source, is always, this is always going to be a concern, is IP issues. But uh, my hope is that there's nothing really all that clever in Boom um, that would hit against um, stuff that's new. Okay. My memory movie from yesterday, my name is Michael Cow. I'm from Samsung. Um, so I think uh, I kind of agree with uh, Jonathan's question. So in the, the RISC V uh, uh, community has been like quite uh, active in showing our kind of war chest of prior art for the ISA. I guess uh, along Jonathan's lines, what about stuff to do with the actual implementation. So is uh, Rocket Chip and the Rocket Chip community going to assemble a similar war chest and how are they going to present that to people who might want to use this commercially? 
Yeah, so absolutely. That's uh, something that uh, I think we're hoping falls into the RISC V Foundation. Uh, I, you know, I, I guess we'll see kind of, uh, you know, at the, at the next workshop, we'll see what working groups are there and, and see if they have one or if that's on the horizon. But I do know that, uh, you know, it is on a radar, this whole PAN issue. Um, you know, particularly what gets really weird is, um, you know, you could maybe, say, buy an ARM processor and deploy it in a product, and you could get sued for ARM having infringed something by a third party. You know, they don't, like, they don't even go after ARM, they go after the guy who used the ARM thing. It's, you know, it's, it's a pretty weird setup, and uh, we're, we're definitely very uh, aware that we need that war chest. Uh, so hopefully that falls in the RISC-V Foundation. Um, but, yeah, I'm just a guy as an academic, so hopefully they can't get much money out of me. Any other questions? Can I start yes. with, oh, sorry, all right. <laughs> I'm Francesco Conti from uh, ETH Zurich and the University of Bologna. And the question is just, uh, you mentioned the zinc uh, board. I was just curious about what is the occupation in terms of utilization resources? Uh, the utilization? Um, yeah, I have, I have, yeah, the ZC706 is a pretty big board, um, and unfortunately the price matches, um, but uh, Boom fits very comfortably on it. Um, I, 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 unfortunately, I don't even have a, a ballpark idea of how many slices are available. I just know the utilization is like, like maybe 20% of the LUTs or something. Um, I know on the Z board, which is, you know, a much af more affordable chip, uh, Boom does not fit if you have floating point or if you make Boom dual issue. Um, so, unfortunately, Boom does require a bit of a big FPGA. Um, and, uh, you know, we're targeting ASIC, so, you know, these things are understandable. Yeah, makes sense. I also know the board quite well. 